What's up? I'm the Shark Damon John here. I am a panelist and investor on ABC Shark Tank. I'm the founder of a company called FUBU, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with the incomparable Damon John. Damon, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Always good to see you, man. Good seeing you as well. So, uh, last time we met, it's been a few years, but I asked you how you got this job. Um, you told me how you got this job. You told me about your Red Lobster days, selling stuff out of the back of a van. Yeah. Um, and that was super inspirational. That was? It was to me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to know, I want to know about power shifts. Um, you know, let's go back in the chronology just a little bit and review for those who didn't get a chance to look at power broke uh -huh. and maybe take that as a springboard into now power shift. So, um, to me, those early stories that you told me of selling stuff out of a van, wh wherever it was, t-shirts or CDs or, you know, whatever you could do to sure. make ends meet was sort of about power broke, wasn't it? It was always a power broker because I had no money. Yeah. Um, so no matter what I was doing, <clears throat> uh, it was literally tapping into my Slack resources and trying to be creative and out hustling other people. And I'm saying hustling in a good way, you know. Um, it was always the power broke. I didn't ask you, I remember, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? When you were a kid, let's take it back a little bit further in the chronology. Yeah, I wanted to be a gazillionaire. Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, quite attainable as far as I was concerned when I was uh, five and 10 and 15. And then reality started setting in. <clears throat> and I tell a story about when I was, you know, I wanted uh, to, uh, I wanted to save up some money and create a crash car business, meaning buying crash cars at 2500 put $2,500 into um, uh, parts and selling the car for ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and I did my math on it. And <clears throat> once I would sell the first car, then I can afford two, and then after that, so on and so on and so on, and I'd be literally a millionaire in two years. And that was purely the map. Um, this was like age fifteen. It was by age sixteen, and I felt that also simultaneously, once I got up to two, three cars. I can drive the cars myself and I wouldn't have to pay for my own car because once I have this car, then I would have another one because this one's being sold. And I was driving around with a big for sale sign on it, but at nighttime when I would go pick up girls, I'd take the for sale sign off. Yeah. And where, for people who don't know where you're from, where are you from? I'm from uh, Hollis, Queens. Well, a couple of things settled in. Number one, I didn't like working on my hands. I just, I just don't like it. Uh, you know, other people who are like, you know, they can pull cards apart. I'm really not good with that. Yeah. Number two is I didn't like the dealing with the people I had to get the parts from because I wasn't dealing with the dealership, yeah. right? And when you grow up in my neighborhood and many neighborhoods out there, you go to these garages and they have all kinds of parts and they're, they're not the most savory characters. Yeah, and you're a teenager and so, you know, probably trying to take advantage of you. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah, listen, they sell you a messed up transmission. You don't have a receipt for that, you know, and you don't want to, there's not the better business bureau to complain to, and you don't want to get your ass kicked either if you yeah. try to tell them, you know, what you're doing. So, you know, the business went to nothing, and um, <clears throat> and that was at the time when, I was about 18, and I did the whole, I'm going to take one year off of school, off of, from going to college, right, because I'm smarter than all the other kids. So you compound those two things together, the failure of the business and lost all my money doing it, the fact that I didn't go to school so I can't say that I had a really great career ahead of me, and the fact that I was doing nothing but maybe odd jobs like working at Red Lobster, and then all the kids that I was making fun of were coming back from college and starting good jobs, it started to settle in that maybe I wasn't as smart as I thought, and you know, as a kid, it's like you think you think you can only see but so so far, right? I was like, well, it's too late for me to start college now. What are you talking about? You're 22 years old, yeah. right? But 
too late for me to start calling. I started making excuses for myself. And I started, but you know, back in the day, I could actually see how you might think that way because that was the way of thinking, right? Yeah. Back when you were in those college days, it was like that. I'm not sure because other people probably didn't use those excuses, but that definitely was the way that I was thinking about it. And most of my friends were dead or in jail because they sold drugs and I was uh, too cute to sell drugs because I knew that if I go to jail, I'd probably, uh, you know, not do well. Yeah. So, um, how about your home life? Did you have, um, support there? Always had a loving mother who, uh, <clears throat> taught me almost everything I know and was a mentor and a great woman. But, you know, they say that they like to induct you in the army between 18 to 20 because you're the dumbest time of your life. You think you know everything and you absolutely know nothing. And so up to 18, 19, 20, didn't listen to my mother because she obviously was stupid because she's my mother. Like, my kids don't listen to me. Didn't have any money. Failed at all the businesses. All my friends who, were, who I came up with were dead or in jail. I didn't go to college. I went to the lowest point of my life at that time. So started to settle in. And I started to settle at that point. Settle to go work as a waiter and say, well... What's the upside of it? Well, I'm never going to go to jail and or have to worry about the cops or people trying to kill me because I'm not doing anything illegal. However, what kind of raise am I going to get being a waiter? You know, other people, you know, they kind of work in, you know, some kind of system where hopefully they get some kind of raise over the years, over the years, over the years. They get benefits. They do a 401k. They do whatever the case is. And then they buy a house at a, at a certain age. The house then grows. They then take the equity out of the house sell it, move to Florida, get a cheaper house, live on from there, and their 401k and retirement fund pays them. I, w I was in a dark place, but none of that was gonna happen to me as far as I was concerned, and I couldn't see past a year. Yeah, so what did you do? When I settled, <clears throat> well, in between that time, I started a little van business, started to learn, it was like a, a <clears throat> we'd go up and down the bus routes and we'd pick up people for a dollar and drop them off. I started to learn a little bit about business there, but, I, but even then, I realized that I was working literally 20 hours a day, and uh, even though I was grossing $300, but after paying for Department of Transportation tickets that I would get because I was taking an illegal route, my van <clears throat> was 20 years old, so high maintenance on the van and paying for gas and paying for insurance, I literally was leaving with, you know, at the end of the month, after working 20-hour days, literally six days a week, I probably would make, at the end of the month, $1,500. Yeah. What did you learn about people during that time? I learned that um, people will pay extra if you treat them better. When I was on the van, I would, you know, end of the night if it was really late. And the van, you know, so, so, so Queens is what they call a, a, a two-fare zone, right? And the reason why the houses are cheaper there is because if you live in the city, and let's say an apartment is, and we're going to talk in today's terms, let's say an apartment is a million dollars. Well, if you live in Queens, the apartment would be, or the house now, would be 400000 The reason why is because you have to take one bus, maybe even two buses and connect, and then one train, and then you get to the city. That's two fares, right? So, and so now, you know... Now you look at an hour and a half to two hours of travel that you can no longer work for work at that time, which means if you double that round trip, that's four hours and you pay two fares. So that reduces the cost of uh, how the houses are because time and time and money compound. Right. So uh, so I learned that when people got off this train, especially females late at night and I'm driving down this one boulevard and they're giving me a dollar, I learned that they would give me two or three dollars if I just made a turn and take them to three, two or three blocks in. So I started to build customers who would wait for me at 12.05. I started to have a bus route like a bus, right? Because they knew that I was going to come pick them up. I'm thinking that you're ahead of your time. You sort of invented Uber. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much Uber. Uh, but, you know, listen, it, it was, it's a common thing in a lot of uh, cities in New York, a lot of, a lot of uh, communities in New York. And believe it or not, my mother did that as a, a, with a big El Dorado when I was, uh, you know, six, seven years old. So I, I, you know, and I turned around and I looked at my life, you know, later on in life, and I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but I did everything my, my mother did. I tried to sew clothes, I tried to be a van driver, I tried to be a waiter, she was a waitress, I tried to do everything. Um, but, you know, I learned, I learned about customer service, I learned about 
finding mentors and I learned that about there was a bigger world out there because I would speak to these people who were coming back from the city and even though we lived in a lower class neighborhood they were brilliant people some of them were accountants and attorneys and uh, teachers and something like that and I would learn from them and I would I would get another bunch of mentors around me that I would learn from and they would talk to me and I learned also to add value to their life you know so those are a couple of things I learned but I also learned that it doesn't matter how much you make it's how much you save or how much you retain or how do you use the tool of money because even after working you know 20 hours a day for five or six days a week and coming home with fifteen hundred dollars when I was literally making three hundred dollars a day grossing that didn't mean anything that didn't even have, mean any, I didn't have any money I also didn't have any medical I didn't have anything else so I go back to Red Lobster I say I want to settle because I just don't want to take this job home with me and nobody's going to wake me up in the middle of the night and ask me for another coleslaw so I go home I, I start working at Red Lobster and I start to now be able to have the food at Red Lobster eat some food make some friends and have, so, have a steady life and uh, make some money and put, you know put money in a little whatever and have insurance and that's when I started to say, well, what am I going to do on the side? I want to just do something I love. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to be able to have access to um, getting onto video sets and rappers and things like that. So I created this brand called FUBU as a hobby. Let's flash forward just a little bit. I want to come back to FUBU. Um, you talk in the book. Um, I love that story of I see you. Mm -hmm. um, talk about how important that is to you, tell that story for us, and then you know, talk about people believing in other people and how that can kind of bolster you up when you need it. Fast forward, uh, you know, FUBU starts to become really big, but it's, it's right here on the mushroom, you know, mushroom clouds here, it's here. I'm starting to do a lot, and there were a couple of brands out. There was uh, Fat Farm and um, uh, Walk Aware, Cross Colors, of course, Carl Kanai. Um, and 40 Acres and a Mule, and 40 Acres and a Mule was owned by Spike Lee. And obviously this guy is a legend. You know, he's one of the first young African-American directors who also showed um, some really edgy stuff, you know, in the community and, 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 and addressed race issues and various other things. And he was... Pioneer. Pioneer, by far. I get a card one day, and I see it, and it's, it says Sp Spike Lee. And I say... Oh, I, you know, and just came in the mail. He has a competing clothing line, yeah, and it's, it comes in the mail in a, in a letter, and it just says, uh, Spike Lee says, "I see you." I don't, I don't even recall there was anything else. I just believe it said, "I see you, congratulations," or something like that. And it was that acknowledgement that I finally had other people looking at me in a positive light that were over me, that were higher than me and that have influenced me. And what are you talking about, you see me? You also have a competitive clothing line. I thought that, you know, when I grew up in the world of business, we were supposed to be mean, ruthless people, crush them, you know what I mean? Like, how dare you? And especially, you know, unfortunately in my community, they all say it's crabs in a barrel and people of color don't help people of color. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. People who don't know each other necessarily, who are living in environments where they're, there's a lack of resources, there's always gonna be conflict no matter what color you are, right? Um, and to fast forward after that, I would get to know Spike pretty well. So did you think, it, were you blown away by it when you got it? I, fr I framed it, I was, I was really blown away by it um, because he didn't know me and he didn't have to take that time to handwrite something to me who could be perceived as a competitor, who could be perceived as a little kid or somebody who's not worth his time. And I would fast forward and I would see him once in a while in passing and then we'd kind of hang out, but I didn't have his phone number and I never told him that story. And uh, we'd go to the Oscars last year when he won that Oscar and surprisingly enough, I walked up to him and I said, you know, I see you. And he was like, I said, I don't think you remember, you, ever wrote, you wrote me that. And he must have known and or remembered in some way because maybe he has sent that to other people. But it was me being able to show my appreciation and show because I was a fan of his from afar. I was a fan. I was way bigger of a fan after I got that letter, period. Right. But uh, but it just shows that, it, that it's circular. Right. It, it, it comes back one way or another. Uh, and it's such a small deed. You know, I'm going to go, of course, and take it to one other small deed that was done. You know, when I was growing up, there was a show called The Odd Couple. Remember The Odd Couple? Oh, yeah. 
uh, Oscar and Felix. So for those who don't know, Felix is this really uptight like. Which one are you? Oh, I'm Oscar all day. Yeah, I left my underwear over there in the corner. But um, when I was on uh, the show, Felix was super uptight. He was like, I guess, uh, what do you call it, compulsive? Like he was like. He was buttoned up, man. Buttoned up and tight. And, and, uh, Organized. Yeah, and his name, the real actor name is Tony Randall. I'm a messenger, I'm a foot messenger. I, I'm the kind of, you know, at, at, and, and I was about 15 years old, 14 years old, I went to a high school where you can go work in the city on a co-op program, you get a credit for working. So you would have two, two, uh, two weeks at school, two weeks working. I was working as a messenger for a venture capital f firm. I, don't, I Think about that, me being a messenger of a venture capital firm now, knowing what I did, it was called First Boston. And we were in the, the messengers in the mail room, not the ones with, good enough to have a bike, the ones with the loud headphones and the and and the and the package, you know, uh, you know, looking at everybody in the elevator and and you know, sound all loud and singing. The whole image, yeah. All right, I'm walking down the street, I'm singing a song, whatever, and there goes Tony Randall, Felix is walking down the block, and I stop and I said, "Oh my God, you're Felix!" And then he just stopped and looked at me and said, "Yes, I am." And he shook my hand. I said, "What's your name?" I said, "I said uh, Damon." And he said, "Really, really, really good to meet you." This is a street with a thousand people. This is like Sixth Avenue. Yeah. And he he would change. He would change who I would later become. My perception and understanding of what a public person should be. You know, when I see people and everybody asks, "Why do I take a picture with them or listen to a pitch and this and that?" It's because there was nobody on that in the entire city of Manhattan but me and Felix for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. And my entire life, I would remember that 20 seconds. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. Like I say, man, I say, man, I say, man. always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view. Uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents. Shotgun.